Uh, thank you for joining us today for In Conversation with Keston Cornwall and Michael Lee Point. All right. Make sure my camera's okay. <laughs> Be aware. Be aware. All right. Hi, Martin. Hey. Great chance to uh, sit down and finally chat. Uh, could you just give everyone listening or watching uh, your full name uh, and any contact information you want to share and just a short introduction to your work? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Robinson. I'm a Costa Rican artist. Uh, you could find me on martinrobinson.com and there you could figure out what it, what it is that I exactly do. If there is something that I do, I'm not sure about it. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry. You're, 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 you're mute or? Yeah, you dipped out there. Oh, I dipped out. Oh, I'm there. Okay. Uh, excellent. Thanks, Martin. Uh, briefly, could you describe your process? Uh, as well as your uh, the combination of mediums you like to work with, and just give the listeners or viewers a, a brief introduction to, to how you work. Yeah, um, my core practice is, uh, let's say, visual art within a major in printmaking, but before that I studied health and human movement. So my practice, let's say, is a kind of mix between health, movement, sports, recreation, and visual arts in a way that I try to incorporate those elements or my knowledge into my practice. And in terms of mediums, I don't have a specific medium. I do think my language is pre-making because that's, that's what I specialized when I, when I went through school, my language is pre-making. But from pre-making, I think I understand other language and I always let the project be the one who determine the, let's say the medium that I'm gonna use. So mostly or more recently, I've been working a lot in video or video installation in a sense that I find a lot of relationship between printmaking and video. And I think that's kind of like in the sense of the repetition, the idea of, of, of the serial, the multiple, I don't know, there, there, there's something in, in the way you, you process printmaking and the way you do video, right? The editing process, the, the way that, that you, you have to create a print. When you're doing print, usually you're doing it backwards. So understanding the, the, the process, and I think that's kind of what is my main practice based on process, within this idea that I've been working more recently in this uh, Tecnologia de Coloniales. So Tecnologia de Coloniales is kind of like my own, my own understanding to this idea of decoloniality and the way people approach it. For me to do a decolonial practice is not about aesthetics. It have to do more with this idea of process. So how you engage in the, in the project, what is the, the meaning of the project and the process is more important than the, than the final project. For me. And I think that's what I was trying to, to, to relate in terms of the medium and the relationship the medium with the specific work and how it worked for me in terms of my language with the spring making. Excellent, understood. Complicated, interesting. Well, and I love the process. Like a pro the process is so valuable. So I like that you're highlighting that. Yeah, I, I, I might say maybe not complicated. I think it's, it's, it's for me, it's kind of being critical with what I'm doing, you know, like, like most of the time, uh, I like to believe that I'm producing from a place that is not based, again, on aesthetics or a market, a specific market. I'm not thinking in how much my art gonna be sell for or how I'm gonna market my art. Most of the time I'm creating projects that had been conceptualized two, three years prior, but I finally find a space in which I could present them. So it's more, it's more an idea of being practical with, with my practice, not only in terms of what I'm producing, but also the economy that's around my practice. I see. Quick question, or uh, this isn't one of the questions, but just so we touch on it. Uh, you, met, you spoke in another language, which was right. Spanish. Could you uh, give the listeners a little bit of background to why you uh, you, you you speak that language? Well, um, my family is actually a mixture of a bunch of stuff. Let's put it that way. Um, my family, like Jamaican, part of my family is Jamaican. I'm other part of my family kind of like from the, let's say, Caribbean coast of Central America, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama. So my family kind of developed in this area, which, Historically, it's been known as Mosquito Land or Mosquito Land. Mosquito Land is like this area that extended from, extended from Honduras all the way to Panama, 
And if you, let's say you visited city areas right now, you could still see a high percentage of black people living in these areas. In Honduras, you have the, the Garifulas, who are this mixture between black and indigenous. Then if you go down in Nicaragua, you have the mosquitoes, which is also another mixture of indigenous and black. And you know, as you go down in Costa Rica, you have the coolies and Panama is also the coolies, which we call coolies, and also a mixture between indigenous and black population. It is believed that most of the people that arrived to this area was people who were enslaved and they managed to escape. And, they're, and once they got to the coast, all these indigenous communities just approach them and, and take them and make them part of them, right? So from that idea that I'm from this Caribbean region, which is always like a region that doesn't have a border, you know, like there is border in terms of geographically or in the map, but in terms of movement, there has ne never been a border. So I speak, let's say a kind of Jamaican, a broken Jamaican or Jamaican slang. There is something specifically to Costa Rica that may make a tell you, so make I tell you, it's kind of like, a, it's actually a life language, you know, it's a Costa Rican life language and it's kind of derived from Jamaican expressions. But if I, I haven't been in the region like living fully for a long time, so I could understand maybe 70% of it right now, but as, cause some of the word has changed meaning when I was a kid and what they mean right now. So it's always shifting and changing. So I kind of speak that language or understand, or understand that language then also Spanish, which is like the main language in Costa Rica. And kind of understand Brazilian and some kind of like Italian because it's kind of, we have a big influence of tourism in Costa Rica. So you always kind of shift in between language or at least trying to understand other person in their language. Understood. So there's a lot of cross cultures there. Right, right, right. It, it, it's a small country with a clash of cultures and diversity. Are you formally trained with your own? I'm formally trained, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm training in, a major in, in art and communication from the National University of Costa Rica. So this is a program, a four years program in which the first year you kind of like, uh, you learn most of the skills, ceramics, uh, sculpture, painting, printmaking, graphic design, you know, textiles, you go through all the process. And then on your second year, you have to pick a spe you have to specialize in one of them. So I specialize in printmaking. In reality, I didn't. When I got into school, I came from another major. I was already working on my master in health. So I came in, like let's say, a bit older or with already a, a knowledge of how the institution system worked. So I thought when I got into art that I was going to be an artist in the sense that. I was going to learn to do everything, right? Ceramics, painting, drawing. And in my first term is when I realized I have to show something in, the, in my second year, you know, like I have to just specialize in one thing. And the way my friends or people who were, who were doing it, like decided it was like, okay, so you really want to be an artist or you just want to play to be an artist, right? So if you really want to be an artist, you have to take this, this, this uh, specialty printmaking because of the person who was teaching that. And the person who was teaching it, it was also a person who was a printmaker. He was a master printmaker, but also he was doing by the time a lot of conceptual art. And once you develop like, again, your language or you went through your first year of printmaking, in the second year of printmaking, it will let you do whatever you want. So if, if you want to do video, you could do video in your second year. If you want to do painting, even though you were from printmaking, it will let you do it. You know, as long as you went through the process of the first year, understanding the technique and understanding all the details of printmaking, you know, and understanding your own language, so you could do something else. So that's the reason I started doing printmaking mostly. Excellent. Could you give them a little more, the listeners and viewers, a little more about your come up and uh, how your training, your formal training, and uh, learning from the printmaker, any others you learned from, how that affected you uh, up until this point? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a hoarder of knowledge, let's put it that way. Not so much about degrees, you know, like I like to learn how things work. 
So for me, since I was a kid, I knew I could do two stuff, either health related or art related. Yeah. I, I knew as a kid also that if it was art related, I had kind of like a spam or, or something like a period of creativity or what I think it is a period of creativity. And of course, no, I understand is, is more of, of a period of doing and a period of thinking, a period of processing and a period of producing, right? Which it's quite different each time, you know, it's quite different. And, and somehow my body understand each one of those processes and it establishes it somehow. So I knew that since I was a kid. So for me, it was going to be problematic to develop a career in which I could be productive and sustain myself if that was the way it was going to work, right? If I was going to be able just to produce two paintings per year or three paintings per year, because that is what my body is dictating of part of the process to, to get there. So I shifted and decided I, I want to do health. So I started, I started studying medicine. When I did that, I realized I was more interested in, I'm more, we're more interested in sport, health, health and sport, you know, like sport medicine specifically. And I kind of shift toward that area, studying sport medicine. I finished that. And then I decided it was time for me to explore my art part. So when I, came into the art part, I think a lot of my scientific development or my scientific knowledge came into play, you know, like exploring the techniques, exploring, you know, thinking about the materials I'm using, you know, like taking it an, another level beyond just the aesthetic of it, thinking of it in terms of how it works with, with the population I'm working with. You know, when I was in sports, I have to deal with kids, I have to deal with, with well, older population, also handicapped population. So you always have to be, you have, I would have to shift, you know, you have an idea what you want to do, but you never know who is the public or who you're going to be working with. So you always have to shift in the moment. So for me, those kind of idea of shifting and, and try to take the best use out of a material or out of something is always there, you know, like exploring it and thinking about it in different ways, not just from the aesthetic perspective, or the art perspective, taking it from that aspect to another one. Understood. This isn't one of the questions, but you touched base on it about health and fitness and how you learned at a long, young age that uh, it, it affected your work. Um, when it comes to like the larger population, like just people in general, do you think uh, health when, and fitness and art, do you think there's a benefit? Is there a connection there um, that other artists could use or benefit that people can get from fitness to apply to their art? Well, I, I would put it this way. I, well, I could talk about this in, in, in different, you know, or, 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 or let's say it's playing it from different contexts. Let's, let's start it with, with the most easy one, right? Which is like the one we live in right now, the pandemic. You know, it, it's, it's like everyone realized that the pandemic is all about the body, you know, it's, it's not about institution. It's not about not having a job. It's not about, uh, you know, it's all about the body. That's period. It's all about the body. So to understand that and understand specifically my practice, I think there is no sort of separation from it. You know, it just came in one. If you think in terms of, of ritual or Caribbean spirituality or, or the idea of producing from other places that is not market market, uh, uh, yeah, market, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a uh, impulse or is not determined by the market in a way. You think that some objects are more related to the self, you know, to a personal experience, the self, and they're part of rituals in which those rituals sometimes are part of the healing process, right? So for me, my practice is part of that, you know, like, like the piece I, I, I did recently, which is, no le digas a mi mano derecha lo que hace mi mano izquierda, which is a video performing installation, you know, deals with that process, not only history, but also the idea of performing on the body and the idea of how that process and that ritual for me, you know, specifically become a healing process. So I don't think there is a separation between them, at least in my work and my practice. I think they're, they're all, they always come together. You know, they're always there. They're, they're, I'm always thinking about them or about it somehow. Understood. So we have Michael Lee Poy with us again today. Hey, Michael, Michael. A few questions for uh, 
for Martin as well. Uh, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. <laughs> I good think afternoon, I, I was, I was, you took away my question, first of all. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, not you, not you. Oh, you answered it. Mark said the, like, you know, health pandemic. I, I, you know, that was my next question. Uh, let me first uh, uh, pronounce your name, please. Martin, 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 Martin. Okay. I don't know, however you want to pronounce it. There is no such thing as pronouncing my name. You know, it's funny because I, I would be, there, there, there is something about naming, you know, and this idea of naming or naming things or, or calling things out, right? So for me, my name have no value at all in that sense. Actually, I could give you at least 20 other names that people know me either in Costa Rica or all over the world, you know? And, and for me, it's just like, oh, okay, I heard that. And, I know who you are. I relate you with that name, that that place, that specific moment, and it's all good. You know, being in sport and, and coming from a from a Latin culture in which you always have nicknames. So I have nicknames when I was part of a basketball team, when I was part of the volleyball team. So it's always kind of shifting. So my name doesn't have that much value in terms of how you say it, because some of my trainer would call me Morton, you know, because and they and they would have the documents every day. Right in front of them, you know, and I would have my name all over the place, but it was still called me Martin, you know. I was like, where are the O's? I just one O in my name. There is no two O. So you know, <laughs> I'm most stressful about the idea of being called professor. You know, if you call me a professor, I would be more stressful with that idea. You know, I would be like, uh, you know, I'm a facilitator, you know, I'm I'm, I'm I believe more in the idea of exchange and knowledge. I'm still in the process of learning, so. I don't think I'm a professor. I'm more into this one-on-one -on -one scale. Right. But well, for us, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, for go us ahead. The community, say the five of us, how would you like us to pronounce your name? Because I've been saying Marton. Whatever. That sounds great. Seriously, I'm, I'm telling you, like, like when I when I got to LA, like, like <laughs> a couple of friends started pronouncing with this Marton, and I was like, whoa, I like that. And you just do it that way. You just love it. Like, I just let people do whatever they want with it. Seriously, I, I know who you, you know who you're calling, I know who you're calling, you know, and, and I know it's not in an offensive, neglected way, so it's all good, you know. Cool. Um, 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 Keston has uh, lovingly curated this project, so uh, in, the, in the title for the email, it's Los Amigos. <laughs> Black, Black Cluster Hire Los Amigos, and that's a shout out to Dean Dory. Boop, 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 boop. Oh. Yes. Uh, <laughs> crazy. Um, so in the context, I, I, I see how you kind of defined your process practice, and, and it's, it's really kind of inspiring in many ways, also being from, you know, the Caribbean basin, right? And, and it's multifaceted, multi, you know, it's just, it goes in so many directions. At right. And I say, you know, it's more contemporary than, than a lot of places in the world, just because the mixing has been going on for you know, so long. Yeah, forever. And it happens everywhere. But right. in, our, in our context, it's more visible, right? Because the populations are, are much smaller and stuff. So uh, it's a shout out to Trinidad and Tobago and the tropics and, and all of that they're going through, you know. Hold your, hold your heads high and just get vaccinated. Can we go back? There's sure. an issue. So whatever question you asked, Michael, could you ask that one more time? Because he, you I'm didn't. Sorry. <laughs> <The second laughs> <issue. laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, we're left one again. Corey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, 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 go for it, go for it. Think my whole thing is crash. I have no idea why. So, cool. No, no worries. We'll get directly to the question. So, no so the, the context of the Caribbean and big shout out to the Caribbean and the Caribbean basin. And, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's a different discourse in, in the different geographies. So North America, America, Turtle Island versus Caribbean, not versus, but, you know, in our black, black diaspora around right. the world, right? How do you kind of define yourself? And, and in the context of Black Cluster Hire, and, and a shout out to Dean Dory uh, for creating this space or des oh, sorry, designing this space, um, how do you start defining yourself? Well, we were, we were talking previously about this idea of Black artists, right? And I mean, I'm not sure if, if 
I actually define myself that way, you know, in a sense. I do know that coming from a context, you know, a Costa Rican context, you know, we even have issues by calling ourselves Latinos. So if you're Costa Rican, you would say you're Tico. You know, that's kind of like her nickname, Ticos, right? So yeah, it might be embedded in, in a really nas nationalist idea, but it's weird because we're not nationalists at all. <laughs> so I think it's more embedded in, in, in a really cultural, you know, kind of like owning, you know, your, your, as you say, your, 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 your geographically, your, your location somehow. You know, yeah, I constantly deal with the idea of blackness. Yeah, when I go, well, I, I know for sure that I'm, I'm not Afro-Latino, that's for sure. I, I, don't, I don't express myself that way or define myself that way. I don't think about the idea of the descendant either because somehow, or even Afro-American and all these ideas, because somehow I think that these are ideas that I didn't kind of like set into place and very put into theories or academia. And, and it's following more certain uh, government ideals more than the people ideals. You know, I, I'd rather be defined as a black person than go through all this term that sometimes it make it more complicated, right? So I could I could talk specifically of my, my experience of a Afro descendant in Costa Rica or Afro Latina, right? I get invited a lot to retrospective dealing with the idea of blackness through Central America or through Latin America. And it's fine. But most of the time when I get invited, the person who are invited me are either based in Europe or they're white, you know, or they're doing a retrospective about Central America, but they're based in Chile, you know, and and some most of the time also they're they're based in Chile working with an organization from Germany in El Salvador, when El Salvador have denied the existence of black people in their country. You know, so it, it kind of like gets so confusing. And I know that there all these projects are out there because we're in the decennial of the, like the 10 years of, 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 of black culture or promotion of black culture, according to the national United Nations or something like that. I can't, I, can't, I, I, I don't know the name for it specifically in English, but it's, in Spanish it's, it's el decenio de la afrodescendencia, kind of like the 10 years of the afrodescency or something like that, right? So there's a lot of money coming in if you're working within that subject, you know, so you could prove that, oh, no, 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 we have inclusion in, in, in our program, you know, so most of these projects would come into a region, do stuff, and they're keep this idea that they're perpetuating and they're helping and visualizing the region and, and the opera descendants of the, it was like bullshit, you know, like you have a bunch of white artists taking pictures of black people, put it in the museums and galleries all over the world, and that's what we look like. You know, and the, and the perspective on the view is not the same as a poor black person in the Caribbean. You know, it, it's a stereotype view of, of us. So, yeah, I, I can I can adhere myself to those terms, and I think it's it's different somehow from the way it's written in North America and the Caribbeans in a way. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think in, in Bermuda people don't think of themselves as black, right? You know, and there's not even the idea of blackness going up through their heads. So, so those kind of kind of like simple ideas, or just the idea also that not all black family had been enslaved, right? That's another that's another idea that that we have to kind of like think about. You know, there are people in Africa who have never been enslaved. You know, but we, we think in Africa as a continent that had been enslaved. So I think that's what is important for me. And sometimes thinking about that, you know, that 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 calling or naming. I think about it also in terms of, you know, carnivals or ideas that are related to those ideas. You know, like in Costa Rica, we, we, we have a carnival in which people dress as African descendants and it's fine, you know, because it's kind of like give them a, a, a sense of belonging to something you know, or, or owning their history. But at the same time, I think we have to question, you know, how is this, is this just a dress up idea that take place one day or this is something that we're taking as part of the culture that we want to to really grow and develop and other people understand what it is, you know, beyond the and there's a dance that you perform like in a specific activities or specific times of the year, right? And this is a dance that is based on a masquerade. So people would put on a mask that looks like a colonizer. So this is indigenous people putting on the mask of the colonizer, kind of like we're doing white face or black face, right? And they put on the mask and that's the day in which they could make ridicule of their colonizer. Mocking. Mock him, you know, like and that's a form of resistance, you know. 
And in Costa Rica, we have El Baile de los, de, de los Negritos, El Baile del Diablito, which is similar also, you know? So it's like all this, this mythological uh, animals or figures that, that goes along a day and they follow the, the colonizer, kill him, you know? And, and you enter this kind of rituals and stuff. And that's the reason I, I cannot talk a lot uh, in my work about masks and masking, you know, the masking of the body. And I wear masks in, in, my, in my work because it comes from that idea, right? Is that is my way to resist that I could embrace all these stereotypes, portray them, make them my own, and find resistance to that. Yeah, for one, for one day. I mean, it happens, you right. know, it's, there's, a, there's a great economist named Lloyd Bess, and he said the Carnival is two days of the year. The masquerade is actually the rest of the year. So it's, per it's performed every day. You know, if I, in, Tr in Trinidad, I can, you know, I can, in old masquerade or what they called old mass, old mass, I can masquerade against the prime minister, right? You know, I wouldn't do that, you know, if the prime minister ever gets to see them, you know, but you're allowed, you have that space to do that. And, and that's right. a joyous space, like, ha, 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 you, you know, that's funny. Or, you know, a, any kind of ridicule is okay because it, it's carnival, right? But um, we're kind of running up on the one hour, I think, or or, or not, but- Keep it going, let's keep it going. I like the conversation, <laughs> get the time. Keep it um, going. Um, yeah, okay, cool. cool. And and um, I think we touched on the professor idea. I mean, I was, I was about to say, Keston, Sorry, and, um, and, and Martin, that, yeah. that they remind you, the students remind you that you're a professor, okay? So even though you are you might not be comfortable with it, they're going to call you professor. Yeah, well, off, all that, and, and get used to it. This is what I'm telling you. This is kind of the warning. But be, I, beyond... I, I got my ways to, 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 to kind of like, like, like have it done. <laughs> it might, not, I got it might not be the right ones, but I have, I have my ways. <laughs> Good. We, we, we all do. Um, assistant professor, how has your, 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 uh, your process been, your onboarding? You're not onboarding as yet, but, you know, involvement with OCADU and, and, and this whole process. We have some, you know, some behind the scenes emails that happen, <laughs> you know, uh, and that's as a result of the pandemic. Honestly, we only had so much power. Um, um, to get, you know, you to Toronto, but, uh, but be that as it may, how, how has it been, you know, um, since receiving the, you know, saying yes to the job? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I kind of mentioned it before and within this idea that the pandemic is not about the institutions and not, not about, you know, the government is about the bodies, you know, and I think that, yeah, you know, like the, 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 the one that suffered the most is the body. You know, you're going, going through a process I mean, of a, a pandemic, you know, moving around when, when you're not supposed to move around, moving around to get to a place which is going to be your, your, your job for a couple of years or moving around just to get your documents, right, which you're not as sure that you want to get. So you're putting your body at risk, you know, and you're going through all this right in the middle of a pandemic just to fulfill your dream to be part of something, you know, so it's complicated to, to think about it and it's complex to think about it also because you're positioning your helpers to gain something. And what is the value of getting that if the process is get, is doing more damage than what my, that, that, than the final result. So, so yeah, it's, it's a lot to digest. And even though I'm out here in, in Canada, I'm still dealing with a lot of stuff, you know. I'm, I'm still dealing with my documentation. I'm still dealing with how do I get a phone if I'm in, in a pandemic and I need a phone to get a bank account. So, you know, so the, the process, it, it, it ain't over yet, right? So once I get all this, maybe it could be part of the, the institution then. But it's it seems to going forward, you know, but it, it's slow. And yeah, you, you, you still have to breathe every day and you still have to like, okay, look, so let's see what's the challenge today. So getting a phone is a challenge. Okay, so I can't deal with that until I'm out of my quarantine, you know. So so yeah, it's something that that that, that is perpetuating over the body, you know. It's, it's nothing else but the body. Oh, say it to anyone. Oh, Martin Robinson. You could just look for Instagram Martin underscore Robinson and Instagram, Facebook Martin Robinson. My website MartinRobinson.com. 
and you could Google me and you could find information out there right here. For sure. Assist, assistant professor. Facilitator, <laughs> facilitator, never professor, facilitator. Facilitator. Blackocadu.ca. Shout out to Dory and uh, thank you. Thank you. Be sure to check out our next episode, blackocadu.ca. Let's go.